415. Hymn 415, moment by moment. Catechism today is questions 89 and 90. Last week we asked the question about who can, who can do this, who can keep the law, and the answer was no one. And then today we come to this question, what does every sin deserve? We can't keep the law because we are in sin. And the answer here is every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. Question 90, what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? The answer, to escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, with diligent use of all the outward means by where Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. A lot of times, especially in different catechisms, or you'll maybe hear people say, um, repentance, and then faith. But in here in the Baptist Catechism, we have faith and then repentance because faith given by the Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer is what causes us to look to Christ, gives us the power to repent unto life and use these outward means. So faith is probably preferably placed at the beginning here. God requires faith, faith we can't produce, but which is given to us by the Holy Ghost.
Okay, if you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I'm going to entitle this message, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? We're going to read verses 6 through 13 today. 6 through 13, is that right? Yes. 6 through 13. We're looking today at 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning here in verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Guess who's coming to dinner? Verse 6 begins the section that I've entitled, Guess Who Was Invited? Well, of course, I think you could probably guess who was invited. It was the beautiful people that were invited to the dinner. Saul is remembering how he chose, or Samuel is remembering how he chose Saul there in verse 6, because if you look at verse 6, it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He's unscrewing the cap of the horn of oil as he looks at Eliab and grinning and saying, well, this was easy. Here he is right here. And suddenly we have the Lord speaking to Samuel. But of course, uh, you know, Samuel has, his head, has had his experience with Saul. And we remember Saul from chapter 9. He was a choice young man and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel, Israel a goodlier person than he from his shoulders and upwards he was higher than any of the people so he's a tall man so Saul was tall and he was handsome and he was beautiful and I'm sure he was strapping and he was capable and all the rest but now here we come to uh, the next choice and he sees Eliab and Eliab must have been tall and he must have been handsome and he must have been strapping the oldest of Jesse's boys and so so Samuel just thinks, well, this is the guy. This is why I'm here. But the Lord puts a stop to Samuel's exuberance. Verse 7, the Lord said unto Samuel, now you notice the instruction here. He says, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. So the Lord stops all that's going on. He stops Samuel in his tracks because, like I said, he's probably unscrewing the horn of oil, and he's getting ready to, to dump the whole thing on Eliab's head. And so, like Saul, this boy, he looked good. He was easy on the eyes. And isn't that the way that we still pick things today? A politician today can have the finest mind, can be a constitutional scholar, be fair, honest, patriotic, but if he's not pretty, who would vote for him? I mean, it's, I mean, if we can be honest with ourselves, isn't that the honest truth? The political parties don't pick the guy with the buck teeth. They just don't. Would we ever have had a Lincoln if there had been TV in his day? I mean, God bless him. 
but he wasn't a handsome man. You know, you look at his pictures and you're like, okay, he was president. But if he had to run for office now, I don't know. And that's how vain we are, because we do look on the countenance. We look on the outward appearance of people. And it's just not in politics, but it's in everything. If you're, if you're selecting a pastor for your church, you might look at his education, you might look at his, you know, his, uh, his experience and his record and so forth, but if he's hard to look at, do you want him to be your pastor? You know, I mean, with, that's, I mean, honestly, that's just how we do, isn't it? Look at the successful megachurch pastors in America today. Are, aren't they beautiful? Sure, they're beautiful. It's because that's how we see men. It's, he says, don't look on his countenance. And then you notice the second thing, or on the height of his stature. This worked for Saul. Why not Eliab? Having a tall man as king would be a positive, just as having a good-looking man as king would be a positive. But does height or beauty speak to character? No, it doesn't. It doesn't speak to character. And then you'll notice that it says there, in, when the Lord puts a stop to Samuel's exuberance here, he says, I have refused him. This is the same word that he used of Saul. It's the word to Refuse or reject. There in 16.1, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? Here it's just translated refused. It's the exact same word. And it's evident why the Lord rejected Saul. We can make a list of the ways Saul failed and rebelled and, you know, dissembled and all the rest. But Eliab? What did Eliab do? We don't know and we'll never know. All we know is the Lord made a choice. So it's not based on the doing. It's not based on the action. It never, ever is. But the Lord, we know that the Lord made a choice. Not based on looks, not based on performance, not based on history or experience or education or family or money or any of that. He simply makes a choice based on his own gracious choice. It's his will. It's his love. It's his desire. That's all it is. So we have the same word used for Saul that's used for Eliab. And this gracious choice is for his own reasons. And Paul treats this in Romans chapter 9 uh, when he says there, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? I mean, wouldn't, that's, that's where we go when we talk about election or choice or God's gracious choice. We say, well, that's not fair. Paul says the same thing. He asks that question. Wouldn't we say then that there is unrighteousness with God? And he answers that question by saying, God forbid. As to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. This is God's choice. He's doing it for his own glory and for his own will. And then he tells us, the next thing here in this verse 7 is the Lord sees not as man sees. Notice that there in verse 7. Now here's our word from last week that's translated provided. When he said, I have refused or rejected Saul and I have provided for myself a king. So again, we have this word. It's the, it comes from the idea to see. And when he said provide, we talked about that. God sees something. He chooses something in this man and now we have the word again, this verb, but now translated to see, the Lord sees something, but he doesn't see like we see. You know, he doesn't have eyeballs like we have. He doesn't have eyeballs connected to a brain like we have. He doesn't have preset things in our minds that when we see things, then we respond in a certain way. You know, God's not looking like that. He doesn't look on an outward appearance. He doesn't look on a color. He doesn't look on a face. He doesn't look at a hairstyle. You know, he doesn't look at how white the teeth are. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't see that or how straight they are or how tall the person is or how beautiful they might be or how they're dressed. God doesn't look for those things, but he sees something else. So what is it that the Lord sees? So we're brought into the mind of God here. For God does not choose based on what's external, but he looks where we cannot. And then he says there in verse 7, For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Adam Clark, uh, in his commentary on this passage, says this about men and how they see. 
He says, it is well that he should, that is the man, the people, we, it is well that he should confine his looks to that, the outside, for when he pretends to sound the heart, he usurps the prerogatives of God. That is so true. When we think we can discern motive, we are so far away from the truth. We can't discern motive. We can't discern character. Only God can do that. So it's good for us to look on the outward appearance. At least he's given us that. But that's not how God chooses. And sometimes we put the outward appearance and the outward deeds and the things that we do above what's in the heart. We don't allow God to make his own choice. And this is good news for us, that God makes a gracious choice according to his own will. Because if it was based on externals, who could make it? Who could make himself taller? Who could make himself prettier or handsomer or younger or older or you know, whatever? What is it that we can do to meet the expectation if it was externals? Well, so many would fall short. And you know what we would have? We would have the exact same society that we have right now, and God would be choosing according to who's the most beautiful, pretty, tall, and whatever. He would go to the Met Gala and pick the beautiful people there, the rich, the beautiful, the, well, the well-groomed, the well-heeled. That's what he would pick. Thank God he doesn't. Remember what Jesus taught us. His care for us is despite all the outside stuff. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If we were the ones that had to produce the beauty and the, and the goodness and all the rest, he would never choose us. But he does, and he cares for us because he knows we cannot. He cares for us, O ye of little faith. And what a wonder of grace it is that he should look on my heart and choose me to begin with. Because when I look on my heart in the quiet and the still of my day, and I'm honest, guess what I find? Nothing there that he would want to choose. Oh, how wonderful, how deep, and how marvelous is the grace of God. So these are the people that are invited to the meal, the beautiful, the tall, the well-groomed. But guess who wasn't invited? Here we have in verse 8 the rejection of all the sons of Jesse. Well, all but one. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. Now Jesse thought that it was important that his sons attend the worship of the Lord. Since he was invited, all of his sons were invited as well. And I think this is the difference between Jesse and Kish. Saul grew up in a home where the altar fires never burned, but not so in Jesse's house. Jesse thought it was important that his boys be there. And so he had them all there except for the youngest. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. That is, Samuel is speaking there. I would like to suggest that we read uh, you notice that it said in the King James, the, neither hath the Lord chosen this. It seems rather impersonal, doesn't it? The this. I think it's, it would be better if we translated this one. Although the use of the demonstrative here quickly moves the narrative along because we have this and this and these. He hasn't chosen this and this and he hasn't chosen these. It's kind of like what we have in Psalm 20. These, those, they, but we. And it moves the narrative quickly along. These trust in chariots and these in horses, uh, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They will fall down and not arise, but we will stand upright and continue. See, that the narrative is quickly moved by these these uh, demonstratives, both near and far. But here we have the near demonstrative this, and I think we probably should say this one, this one, because it's specific. You know, it's, it's very specific. The Lord hath not chosen this one. 
And verse 9, Jesse made Shema to pass by. He said, neither hath the Lord chosen this one. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. The Lord's making his choice. You would think out of seven there would be at least one of them that would be there. But no, 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 they haven't, they haven't gotten them all yet. Notice the poverty here of Jesse, verse 11. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. He didn't have servants to do the shepherding job. He just had children. That's why he had so many, I guess. You know, He needed the hands. And so he, he is invited to this wonderful worship time, and he gets all of his boys together. They put on their Sunday best, and they go to meet with Samuel. But the youngest one, who's probably just a lad, he says, listen, honey, you'll get to go, but not today. Go, I need you to go out and keep the sheep for me. You're doing the Lord's service by going and helping your daddy by keeping the sheep. And so David, obedient to his daddy, he walks out into the field and he keeps the sheep on the hillside while dad and all the brothers go to this worship service with Samuel. He didn't have anybody else to do it. And he was invited to this worship by Samuel. So who's going to keep the sheep? Well, he gets the littlest one to go because he, maybe he thinks the littlest one won't understand everything and the littlest one, you know, he, he's not going to be, you know, he's not, maybe he's not ready yet, you know, to be there at the worship time. And so he needs somebody. Somebody's got to do it. So he sends little David out into the field to keep the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. <laughs> Samuel's task is just that important, and nobody's going to eat, nobody's going to sit until little David is joining them. So Saul's task, he, sends, he, sends, he says to Jesse, send for him, and we're going to wait. He's, we're not going to do anything until he gets here. Uh, this is also a blessing as we consider his grace, you know. It's not about money. It's not about riches. It's not about fame. Kish was a wealthy man, but Jesse doesn't appear to be. The choice of God doesn't depend on the size of your pocketbook, your bank account, your trust fund, or your IRA. God's choice is based simply on his precious grace. That's it. So we have a poor man with a lot of boys, and the youngest one's out keeping the sheep. And how long do they stand there? Don't know, uh, however long it's going to take uh, one of the other boys to run out and get David and send him back. Maybe Jesse, and you notice there in verse 12, it says, he sent and brought him in. Maybe Jesse's had Eliab to run and fetch him out of the field. But Eliab had to be there for the anointing. So they're going to leave the sheep all by themselves. Or maybe they employed a neighbor to watch the sheep while they were away. Or maybe a daughter was to go out and watch the sheep while they were away. Or maybe the wife goes out and watches the sheep while they're away. Somebody had to watch the sheep. And the boys had to be with the dad and with David. And David had to be amongst the brothers. And so the sheep had a problem. The sheep were going to be all by themselves. And you leave sheep by themselves and there's no telling what trouble they'll get into. You have to have a shepherd there. So somebody had to go back out there and watch them. Now you notice the description of this one that when he walks into the worship time there in verse, is that verse 8? <clears throat> no, I'm way past verse 8. 11? 12. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm almost done. I'm working my way here. He sent and brought him in, and now he was, notice the language here, ruddy. He was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Be careful here. Don't fall back into looking on the outside again. Don't do it. Even though we have this description of him, he's, you know, it's, it's not his handsome stature that the Lord is choosing. It's something else, something in the heart. But notice the description. He's ruddy and of, with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. This guy's easy on the eyes too. He's a handsome, beautiful lad. 
But many take this word ruddy to mean red-headed. Red-headed. And if he's red-headed, then what's his skin going to be like? He's going to be fair-skinned. He's not going to have that olive complexion that so many in the Middle East have, the Jews included. You go to Israel today and you'll see all this black, curly, bunchy hair and this beautiful olive complexion that they have. But not David. No, David. Apparently, David was red-headed and fair-skinned. And that's, that is a lovely combination, but of course you know what, it's, what they say about someone who's red-headed. They have a fire in their soul. And, so, and we find out about David's fire uh, as we continue in, in the study of 1 Samuel. So this red-headed boy comes in. He's beautiful to look to. He's got a fair complexion. And, but just remember, God's not picking him because of that. It's something else. But notice here how specific God's choice is. The Lord said to Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Again, we have the near demonstrative, this. But it's put so simply here. This is he. This time without the negative. This is not the one the Lord has chosen. See, here it is, this is the one the Lord has chosen, and he puts his finger down on this boy. And do you know every time he chooses, he doesn't choose in batches. He chooses specifically. And he looks at you, and he looks at me, and he says, this is he, this is her. I'm choosing this one. It's always specific. It's always personal. God doesn't choose in batches. He chooses individuals. Now, it says there in verse 13, 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel uh, here takes the horn of oil and anoints him in the midst of his brethren. Now, I don't know if you remember, but in 1 Samuel chapter 9, it said that uh, Samuel took a vial of oil. Samuel... uh, was taking a whole horn of oil here, but on Saul, he just took a vial of oil and anointed him. Now he pours out on him this whole horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Saul was anointed privately on the roadside, but David before all. This reminds us of the public anointing of Jesus at the baptism of John by the Holy Spirit and the anointing by Mary before the crucifixion. Both were public and in the midst of his brethren. So even here, at the calling of David, at the anointing of David, we have something that reminds us of the Savior. And so many things now about the life of this one named David are going to be reminding us of him. So I'm going to stop right here, but I hope that you saw the pastor's letter this past Tuesday, because I talk about the contrast that the writer gives us between verse 13 and verse 14. Because in verse 14, we have the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, when in verse 13, we have the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. So there's this lovely contrast that builds here. Although David doesn't become king when he's anointed, Saul stays king, but there's a transfer. The Spirit of God comes upon David, It leaves Saul, and the evil spirit from the Lord plagues or terrorizes Saul. I hope you go back and and look at uh, the pastor's letter, if you haven't seen it, for last week. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, and so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Not his father's choice. Eliab was his father's choice. Eliab was everybody's choice. Samuel's choice. Not the prophet's choice. Those ones didn't receive the Spirit of God on that day. No, it was God's gracious choice of a poor man's youngest red-headed boy, the one everybody passed over. But thank God, he did not. And ladies and gentlemen, he does not pass over you either. His choice of you is not based on what you have done or who you are or where you are or the condition of your heart, it's based on his own choice. Let's thank God for that. Father, we're so grateful to have had a moment to look at this passage and all the wonder that's here. 
And Lord, we just thank you so much for the way in which you work and what you've described for us here in the life of David and in the life of Samuel and in the life of this poor man, Jesse, and his family. We ask, Lord, that you would bless now as we conclude with our final hymn, for we pray in Jesus' name. Joy is going to come and lead us in our closing hymn, and then I hope that you'll remain seated as we prepare for the Lord's Supper.